Hey, what's up YouTube? I recently released a Blender add-on that lets you bake all kind of data into UVs on Vertex Color, things like pivots, axis, mask, hierarchy, and so on, and that hierarchy feature is really something I wanted to implement, but honestly at first I had no idea where to start. Now it's nothing new, I think I discovered these UV baking techniques when I first stumbled upon Pivot Painter 2 years ago. Pivot Painter 2 is a 3ds Max script that allows you to bake information in the form of UVs and textures to let you reconstruct a complex hierarchy in engine and build intricate motions and effects using a single mesh. This script was later ported to Houdini and there's also a Blender version as well, link is in the video description below. So in order to create my Blender add-on, I first took a long look at how Pivot Painter 2 was built and I thought I'd do a quick video on the subject, because it's all in all quite technical, yet very interesting. There's quite a few things to learn here, I reckon. So how does this script work? Alright, so the first thing the script does is to generate a UV map to give each individual mesh a unique UV coordinate. That will correspond to the position of a single pixel in two textures that the script also generates. One texture encodes the XYZ positions of those meshes in RGB and their parent index in the alpha channel. The script also allows you to bake other data in that alpha channel based on what you're trying to do in engine, but let's focus on the parent index for this video. That parent index is really important because it allows you to compute the parent mesh's UV coordinate from that single index value and thus know where to sample the texture to get its data. The way that UV coordinate is computed is quite straightforward. We know from the texture size how many indexes we have per line and per row. So say we have a 100 by 100 texture, index 234 would be 100, 200, 34 here, right? And so you see, if we sample the texture here at first, that would give us our mesh's XYZ pivot position on its parent index. From that index, we could derive yet another UV coordinate to sample the texture again and get our parent's XYZ pivot position and the index of its own parent, which we'd use to derive another UV coordinate, sample the texture again, and so on and so on. So we can jump from parent to parent and walk up the hierarchy tree as much as needed. Right, so the second texture is pretty similar to the first one, but encodes the x-axis vector of those meshes in RGB and their length along that axis in the alpha channel. In Unreal Engine, most people use the Pivot Painter to foliage material function provided by Epic, so let's have a look at it. It's quite intimidating, so it seems to call this massive function four times, and that function itself seems to be quite complicated, right? So the first thing I usually do when I try to understand a complicated material function, like this one, is to clean it. And thanks to name reroute, we can now avoid this spaghetti mess and rewire everything properly. Better, right? Exact same logic, but much cleaner. Do the same thing for that big material function, which once cleaned isn't that scary anymore, but we'll come back to that one later on. Let's start at the beginning here. This is where the hierarchy is reconstructed and where that jumping from parent to parent thing happens. We first have that getIndex function, which takes as input parameters both the UV map generated by the script and the texture size and returns an index based on that simple index counting method I briefly mentioned earlier. Here that position and parent index texture is sampled the first time to get the parent index of all meshes. From that index we get that parent UV coordinates, like I explained earlier, and sample that position and parent index texture again at those parent UV coordinates to get the parent's parent index. And you get the idea from that parent's parent index, get the UV coordinates, sample the texture one more time, and so on and so on. And that's how we walk up the hierarchy tree and build a list of UV coordinates that points to a mesh entire hierarchy, itself, its parent, its parent parent, and so on. Now there's this material function here that I will explain later on because it's super weird and confusing, so don't pay attention to that just yet. Now, before moving on to the next part here, we have to understand something. This hierarchy reconstruction happens for all vertices, right? So let's take that vertex, part of that leaf mesh. That leaf mesh is parented to a smaller branch, that smaller branch is parented to a main branch, and that main branch is parented to the trunk, right? So that specific vertex here would get access to the trunk's pivot and axis data by sampling the corresponding textures at the fourth hierarchy level. Okay, now let's take that other vertex, part of that main branch. 
this branch is parented to the trunk, so that vertex would get access to the trunk's pivot and axis data by sampling the corresponding textures at the second hierarchy level. And then it would continue working up that hierarchy tree unnecessarily, but that's not a concern, although it does cost performance for no use. So you understand that in order to make the entire tree sweep around the trunk's pivot point and axis, we have to select which UV coordinate to use when sampling those pivot and axis textures based on where that vertex being processed is in the hierarchy. And that's precisely what happens here. This is a simple counter to indicate how many parents a vertex has. It'd be 3 for leaves, 2 for smaller branches, 1 for main branches and 0 for the trunk. Here we want to figure out where to sample the pivot and axis textures to get the trunk's data, what I call the level 1, the root of our hierarchy tree. And this here basically lets us choose which parent UVs to use. If the vertex being processed is part of a leaf mesh, then the trunk would be its third parent. If the vertex is part of a smaller branch, then the trunk would be its second parent. You get the idea. We also have a mask for each level but the first one, because we obviously want to apply the sweep motion around the trunk's pivot point on the whole tree, so there's no need to mask anything for the level 1. Same for level 2, the main branches. At this point, any rotation or motion we apply on the main branches should be applied to everything but the trunk. So if a vertex is part of a mesh that has at least one parent, thus not part of the trunk, then we're good to go. And we select which UVs to use once again, but now the trunk is now irrelevant, so there's one less UVs to select from. And same for level 3 and level 4, right? Hopefully that made sense, it's a bit hard to explain. Once we have that data prepared, we can call those functions and pass that data to sample the pivot and axis textures at the correct coordinates. This is going to rotate the whole tree around the trunk's pivot and axis. This is going to rotate everything but the trunk, so the main branches, smaller branches and leaves, around the main branches, pivot and axis. And you get the idea, this is going to rotate everything but the trunk and main branches, so the smaller branches and leaves, around the smaller branches, pivot and axis. And finally, this here is going to rotate the leaves around their own pivot and axis. So that function here looks scary, but it isn't that complex, and the way it's built is highly subjective, and highly depends on what you're trying to do and what kind of wind animation you're trying to create and all that. So there's many ways to do this. Basically, we figure out the rotation axis here and the rotation angle here. The rotation axis is mostly based on an RGB noise texture sampled at coordinates shifted based on time and also offset in space to sample that wind texture near the tip of each meshes rather than at their pivot location. So yeah, we get a rotation axis here, and a rotation magnitude here to modulate the maximum rotation angle, that is further faded out based on how much meshes faces the wind direction and the distance to the pivot point and that kind of stuff. Once we have that, we rotate our vertices around their pivot point, and also rotate the normals, which are in world space. That gives us our level 1 world position offset and normals. And we do the same thing for level 2, we send normals that were rotated by the level 1, right? And repeat for level 3 and 4. Now, you may have picked up a tiny detail. For level 3, we send the level 4 world position offset. For level 2, we send the level 3, and for level 1, we send the level 2 offset. Weird, right? Well, it's actually a fix I made because Pivot Painter 2's original material function doesn't stack rotation like you're supposed to. They simply rotate vertices individually for each level, and add the offsets together at the end, and it's bad. It hugely deforms the mesh. It isn't that noticeable as long as rotations are kept somewhat small, but it's not the correct way to do it. You're actually supposed to chain rotations from the child to the root, each time adding the rotated offset to the position to rotate. You can go the other way around and chain rotations from the root to the child, but that requires you to rotate pivot points along the way as well, and it's unnecessarily complex. If you want to implement that fix yourself, you can do so easily. First, add a vector input pin to that material function, add it to the position to rotate, like so. Pass the world position offset of level 4 to level 3, level 3 to level 2, level 2 to level 1, and the final world position offset is that level 1 world position offset. Now, you may think this is kinda backwards and forces you to have all levels enabled at all times, right? But no. If you disable, say, level 3 and 4, then this is going to pass 0, 
this zero as well and so level 2 will have a previous world position offset of zero and no logic in those functions there is processed right it's a bit counterintuitive but whatever and voila it's pretty much it now we have one last thing to explain and oh boy buckle up remember that function okay this alpha outputs the parent index right so why do we need to unpack it or whatever well, if you're somewhat familiar with programming, you know that there's two ways to represent a number using bits. We have integers, allowing us to represent, well, integer numbers, and we have floats, allowing us to represent a very wide range of real numbers. And so it's two different ways of describing a number using bits. Integer on one hand uses very simple binary logic, float on the other hand is something else entirely. A 32 bits float as 1 bit for the sine, 8 bits for the exponent, and 23 bits for the mantissa. That's because a float encodes a number using what's called the scientific notation. And so let's compare the two. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Right, so same numbers but completely different way of using bits. Our parent index here is supposed to be an integer, okay? Yet it's actually stored in a float in those textures. More concerning, those HDR textures in a new engine are 16 bits, which is most often way enough precision for what you want to do with HDR textures, but can be problematic when encoding data and large integers. And Pivot Painter 2 supports a large number of entities, up to 30 thousands. And at that range, 16 bits float do not have enough precision to properly describe 30 thousand different integers. And so to go around that, if you open the 3ds Max script, there's this bit of logic here. This basically takes the bits of a 16-bit integer and spreads them in the sine, exponent and mantissa components of a 32-bit float. The 32-bit float is then going to be converted to 16 bits in our HDR texture, but since we only encoded a 16-bit integer to begin with, the integer bits survive the conversion, if you may. And so in Unreal Engine, when we sample that float from the alpha channel, as a float we get a garbage number, but that's fine because we are just interested in the bits that it holds to reconstruct our number as an integer. And so this material function here has custom HLSL code that takes the bits of that float and reorders them to reconstruct our initial integer to give us a precise and accurate index. And that's what we call black magic. <laughs> Voila, if you're interested in getting your hands on that fixed, cleaned up and documented material function, I made it freely available on my Patreon, link will be in the video description below. I hope you found that video useful and that you learned a thing or two along the way. I'll see you in the next video, take care of yourself, bye bye!